University of Washington, this is the International Space Station. How do you hear? We can hear you fine, Josh. How are you? And Josh, we're being notified here that the patch is still being made, so give us about 30 seconds. Okay, thanks for working it. For those of you asking questions, it will be a slight lag. It's not too bad, though. It's actually, it's actually decent. University of Washington, this is the International Space Station. How do you hear? We can hear you clearly. Can you hear me, Josh? Got you loud and clear. Welcome to the International Space Station. Josh, it's Greg. How are you? Doing great, Greg. You guys have good video down there? Uh, we have great video. We have great video. We can see you clearly. They're looking very patriotic this morning. It's, uh, it's Friday evening as far as I'm concerned. That's true. Jo Josh is on Greenwich Mean Time, by the way. So um, it's, he's nearing the end of his day. We're not to lunch yet, Josh. So anyway, we want to get a, um, into our questions here. Um, I have told them about our experience together, your background, and I want to, um, given that we're at a university right now, talk a little bit about education. Uh, we obviously went to high school together. We got people watching in White Bear Lake, Minnesota. We got people watching in Albion, Michigan, where you got your degree in physics. I know you talked to the University of Rochester um, earlier today. Could you just talk a little bit about education and, and the importance it's had in your both professional and personal growth and development? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, uh, so cool to have White Bear Lake and Albion and University of Washington all tied in. Uh, this is just making my day. This is super cool. Um, but yes, uh, I'm glad you phrase it that way because I would say that the educational community that we come from, uh, the multiple communities, uh, have equal play in both my personal and professional life. Uh, and if you ask some people, I haven't quite figured out what I want to do when I grow up. Um, but I will say that... Uh, both of those places in particular, White Bear Lake and in Albion, um, I, for me, uh, felt like it, it really fostered an environment uh, where we were able to explore something that I call academic courage. Um, now, that wasn't a term that I had uh, then when we were kids, um, and it, it took many years for me to kind of look back and see what, see what we had available to us. Um, but, you know, our, our professors, our teachers, our classmates uh, all created this environment in which you could be courageous. And you know, a lot of people define courage as being afraid, but going anyway. Um, so to, you know, to go counter to a pretty famous quote, I would say that fear uh, is a critical ingredient and you really need that uh, in order to be able to, to take that, that step uh, to do something that isn't quite comfortable. And that's why I went into physics. Um, it was something that I didn't quite understand uh, you know, at the end of high school and that kind of frustrated me. And so that was something I really wanted wanted to get into. Uh, and it was very daunting. Um, for me, uh, you, know, you need to learn a new language. In, in this case, it happened to be math and sometimes it's jargon, um, but that's how it played out for me. Uh, and I've been very lucky and been able to use that same concept, again, not really having a name for it, um, but I've been able to use that throughout my life and just do the things that I'm passionate about, things that I'm curious about, things that I'm interested in. Um, usually learning stuff that other people probably already know that I, I didn't know yet, uh, but that's exciting for me. Uh, but then sometimes we can be a part of something very big like this on the International Space Station or when I did high energy physics uh, to be able to, to develop uh, knowledge and understanding on behalf of society so that we can all progress. So it all starts uh, really early and uh, I just hope we, uh, we never lose that sense of curiosity among all of us. So, um Josh, as you know, people here may not know, um, my family and I were fortunate enough to come down to Florida to watch you launch and hang out with family and friends. It was an unbelievable experience. As I've told you, Josh, I was a nervous wreck. I'm really curious as that as those numbers were counting down, um, while those of us on the ground were nervous, what was, what was your feelings and emotions at that moment when you started to feel the rumble? Yeah, so, well, first of all, uh, being a nervous wreck is, is not an option for us. Um, and I'll tell you what, it, it wouldn't do us much good. Um, to be perfectly honest, the training is so thorough. The teams that, that put together our training and, and the, the operations that we're executing, they are such phenomenal groups of people. Um, 
that really what was going through my mind is I was really, really excited to get to work. We had been training and simulating everything, uh, whether it be launch day, whether it be being up here on the space station and working uh, here on a normal day, dealing with emergencies, uh, dealing with problems, hardware problems here, going out and doing spacewalks, robotics, all of it. We've been doing this training, but it's all been for pretend. And at that moment, when that countdown eventually got to zero, uh, now we were headed to work. And that's all I was uh, thinking about at that moment was I finally get to get to work and, and do something with all of the effort that all the people have put into training me for it. Um, I'll be honest, uh, not all of us were completely awake for the entire countdown, but we certainly were awake when, uh, when we got down to those small numbers. Uh, that's pretty funny. So la my last question, Josh, and then I'm going to turn it over to some students here. You know, I've, I shared with the group here that this has been a goal of yours for a long, long time, really since I've known you, um, since we met in, in middle school and in high school. A lot of people in this room have goals. Sometimes those goals are achieved and sometimes they aren't. My goal is to be the quarterback of the Minnesota Vikings. I'm still waiting. There's a little life in this 50-year-old arm. But talk a little bit about the importance of goals, because there was no certainty that you would be an astronaut, right? A lot of amazing people apply and don't necessarily get it. And so talk about the importance of goals and working towards something, even if you don't, if the outcome is uncertain. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, maybe uh, maybe I'm a clerical error and I shouldn't have been here in the first place, but it's too late for them to, to take it back. Um, but a lot of times uh, we don't achieve goals. And I think that's OK. Um, that is that is part of life. Um, as long as your path towards that goal is lined with your your true passions. Um, and if you're doing that, then you know what you are actually going to attain your goal. But the goal might actually change as you're on that path. You might find a new, cooler, more interesting goal. Um, and it it isn't always necessarily necessarily the big things, right? The 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 ordinary part of life sometimes is the most magical. So um, I would say, yeah, set a goal. And if you love what you're doing on the way to that goal, then yeah, that's a real possibility. And if it's not, if it doesn't end up happening, that's that's not a, a failure in any way. Um, in fact, I'll tell you real quick uh, before we get to the questions. Um, when uh, I got the call uh, that I was uh, being offered this job, um, I, I had just uh, left the Navy for uh, what I thought was um, the rest of my career. And I was in the reserves and had just started a, a small company with a, a good friend of ours from, from Albion College. And uh, it was really exciting uh, work that we were doing. It was a branch of physics that uh, was not my uh, background. I had never, I had never dealt with, with quantum optics, uh, but I was learning as I went. And it was really, really cool to learn something new. Um, and of course, that's the moment in my life when I get the phone call. And um, when Janet Cavandi, a seasoned astronaut, uh, director of flight crew operations, called me, uh, I picked up the phone and she, she identified herself and said, hey, Josh, how would you like to come down to Houston and be an astronaut? And apparently my reaction was, oh, crap. And I think that kind of speaks to where you want to be in life, right? It, you want to be in a position where if you did have a goal, there was somewhere you were headed and now it ends up, ends up happening. Wow. You realize, man, actually getting there is, is great, but where I was, was pretty awesome too. Um, so just, uh, I would say I wouldn't get too hung up on, uh, not achieving a goal. Absolutely go for it, but just know that there are plenty of, uh, absolutely amazing and very, very satisfying goals out there. That's awesome. Thanks, Josh. I'm going to now um, pass the mic over to some students from Lummi Nation School, which is just north of Seattle near Bellingham. And they were the ones who had an experiment on the space station with you. I did that one. I got lucky enough to be the person who started the germination uh, for Devil's Club. I mean, there's there's seven astronauts or four astronauts and three cosmonauts up here. So it didn't uh, necessarily uh you know, by definition, be my work, but uh, certainly I got lucky and I got to do that one. I started it. Uh, we started the seeds growing and then we uh, sent them back on SpaceX 26. And I bet they're back in Bellingham, Washington. All right. Hello, my name is Jada Wilson um, from Lummi. I'm in the ninth grade. And my question is, do you notice any differences if you sleep on your side, back or face down? <laughs> did you hear me? Hi, Jada. Uh, well, it's 
it's really cool when you're here. As you can see right now, uh, the ceiling is something that we can use because it's available to us. The floor, we don't need, so we can use that. We use the walls. So what I'm telling you is when, when I'm sleeping in my crew quarters, in my, in my uh, sleeping bag, it's strapped up against the wall. Uh, but my wall happens to be the floor of the space station, if there was such a thing. Um, so I have no idea when I'm in there, uh, you know, which way is up. And it doesn't really matter which way is up. So um, I can't really feel myself on my back or on my side. Um, I will tell you, sometimes I, in my sleeping bag, I'll make it a little bit tighter uh, just to kind of get that cozy feeling. And I'll maybe turn to the side so that the, the sleeping bag's a little bit tighter. But uh, I'm really not feeling any pressure at all unless I really, really make that thing tight and pull myself back to the wall. All right, thank you. Um, hello, I'm Madison Wilson, a junior at LMS. Um, how much does your spine shrink in size? How much does your spine shrink in size or grow in size while you're at the ISS? So uh, this is something I'm really looking forward to. I think you said your name was Madison. Um, so Madison, here's the deal. Uh, when I interviewed at NASA, um, you know, they do all these kind of medical checks and they put you, uh, one of the things, of course, they're going to check is your height. And they put me up against the wall and I, and the woman said, okay, you're five, nine. And I said, and three quarters. And she said, excuse me. I said, well, I'm five, nine and three quarters. And she said, really? I said, well, my wife is five, nine and three quarters. So when you're five, nine and three quarters and your wife is a five, nine and three quarters, you know, you're five, nine and three quarters. So she had me hop back up against the wall and she told me, Hey, you're five, nine. So <laughs> what am I excited about? One of the things is when, when we splash down, I'm probably going to be, I would guess at least five, 10 and a quarter. I think I get at least a week of at least an inch, if not an inch and a half. Some people grow two inches. Um, and it's because that S in your spine, uh, you know, starts to straighten out. We've, we're going on our fifth month here. So uh, there's been uh, no real compression on that spine, except for when we do uh, running on the treadmill or when we're, we're doing the equivalent of lifting weights, we have, uh, we pull against a vacuum, but that's where the pressure is on our spine. Otherwise, like right now I'm just floating. Uh, so yeah, it will, uh, I'll get a little bit of height and I'm going to use it to my advantage. And even if I'm not feeling great, we're going out to dinner because I'm taller. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Hey, Josh, I'm Tony Klein. I'm an 11th grader at Lummi Nation School. And um, this question has my name on it, but I remember I didn't write this. So this one actually isn't mine, but that's okay. When I spin around here on Earth, I get dizzy. When an astronaut spins around in space, do they get dizzy? Why or why not? Okay, Tony. Um, well, you should take credit for this one. I don't know if uh, if you know about the uh, the new show that uh, Nicole, my friend Nicole, and I have recently uh, taken on the road. Uh, it's either a, a coincidence or you did it on purpose. Um, but uh, I will show you what happens um, here and how an astronaut can get dizzy. Uh, one of us is going to get more dizzy than the other. And it's not the one who's more massive. So this is Nicole Mann. She uh, is commander of Crew 5 uh, on the uh, SpaceX Crew Dragon. And she's up here uh, for, well, she, it feels like uh, 10 months, but she's been up here with, uh, for five months with me. Uh, I, I'm sure that that makes it feel a little bit longer for her. So um, here we go. Take a look. <laughs> I love that. I love that part because a Marine Corps fighter pilot rarely gets dizzy, but she's got about 10 minutes before the world stops spinning. <laughs> That's awesome. Josh, we're going to turn it over to, to uh, some students from UW right now. That sounds great. 
Hello, Dr. Casada. My name is George. I'm a, a dual title PhD student in oceanography and astrobiology. And I wanted to ask you uh, what I know astronauts execute uh, science experiments devised by others. I was wondering what avenues do you have to express your academic creativity? Yeah, uh, I will tell you that was one of my first questions. Um, you know, when we interview, uh, we're getting asked the questions, but at the end, we get to ask a question. And that was one of my very first questions: was uh, Do we have an opportunity to uh, to run our own experiments up here? Uh, now, I come from a physics background, and so those are a little harder to run just on your own. Uh, I've got a handful of like little uh, cool fundamental physics stuff uh, that I goof around with up here. Um, not in, not. Uh, excluding the one we just saw, right? That's conservation of angular momentum. Um, you know, we, there's little cool things that uh, that you can do up here. Um, but in terms of big experiments, um, I have not been able to do any. Uh, we don't really have the time for that. Uh, there's anywhere from two to 400 different experiments uh, going on on board um, at any one time. And so it, you know, you tend to be the, the hands and the eyes and the, the ears of the researchers on the ground. Um, so for me, uh, the way that I can can best, you know, explore that that uh, academic uh, creativity for me is actually to learn more about what what's being done, uh, what's going on with these experiments. We've got a really cool uh, experiment on the on the outside of the space station uh, that is tracking precisely uh, neutron stars, um, and even to to a certain level, trying to figure out if we can use pulsars, these rotating uh, neutron stars, as a way to navigate in space. And you know, these are things that I've never done. I'd love to do astrophysics at some point in my life. Um, but I, you know, we get to learn about these things. Uh, but in terms of running my own experiment up here, I haven't been that lucky. Um, I did realize that uh, on the treadmill, when I'm running on the treadmill, I build up a lot of static uh, electricity. And so we realize every time we go to push a button on the, on the laptop that we shock ourselves. And so uh, what I figured out with my friend Koichi is that I had him send a little drop of water right at me. And I was able to move that drop of water around in the space station just by pushing it with my static charge, which was super cool. <laughs> that is cool. Thank you. Hello. Very nice to see a fellow physics major. I am. My name is Karina. I am from the University of Washington, a junior, and I'm also I am studying applied physics. And my question specifically would be, what advice would you give your younger self, specifically whether it be college age or high school age? So uh, I love this question because uh, you're making me think. Um, uh, so I'm I'm lucky in that uh, I have had a path uh, where I was kind of living this already without really realizing it. It wasn't until I was a little later in life where I kind of put things in perspective and started asking myself the question, what's the best that could happen if I made this decision? And what's the worst that could happen if I made this decision? And often the ones that we end up not doing uh, are much more daunting in our minds than they are in real life. And then you, when you think about it, when you kind of articulate that and make, force yourself to answer, what's the worst that can happen here? Am, am I going to be unemployed? Probably not, right? If this doesn't work out, I can probably still put food on the table at the end of the day. And that was honestly the impetus for, for starting a, a company. You know, companies fail. They don't, most don't make it. Um, but, you know, for, for my friend Aaron and I, we thought, you know what, why not give it a shot? What is the worst that's going to happen? And, and counter to that, what's the best that can happen? Um, so uh, I think that question uh, is is the advice I would give my younger self. Um, but thankfully, I was I was already living that by accident. Um, and the other thing I would give uh, advice I would give myself isn't so much advice, but I would show myself a picture. Um, I don't know if you ever uh, read the the blog Wait But Why, um, but Tim Urban uh, writes this great uh, blog. And I actually got to talk to him while I was up here, which was really neat. We just had a, a personal conversation. So I don't think he would mind me uh, mentioning this, but every year, maybe two years, I see uh, an article that he wrote about time and time management. And I actually have a picture. Uh, this is the one that every time I see it, it, it just strikes me. And I always say, no way, that can't be right. That can't be true. And I'll try to get to the camera here without knocking it over as I float up. Um, but this is, a representation of every year of a 90-year-old person's life. 
Is that in focus there? In, in my world, that is not enough squares. That is amazing to me that each one of those squares represents one year in a 90 year old's life. And so um, every time I see this, it kind of refocuses me on the things that are important in life. Um, I don't want to waste any squares. And um, that doesn't mean going and getting more degrees necessarily. And that doesn't mean accomplishing more that they can be put on a resume. Um, it just means doing what you love. And sometimes that's like I mentioned earlier, sometimes that's the ordinary part of life that makes life absolutely extraordinary. So I guess I would say don't lose perspective of the boxes. All right, that's some really good advice. Thank you, we appreciate it. Hey Josh, my name is Dylan Schultz, I'm an engineering. Oh, sure. Hey Josh, my name is Dylan Schultz, I'm an engineering freshman here at UW. And NASA estimates that the minimum trip to Mars would be about 21 months, which is double the current record for in-space time. My question is, would you be willing to spend two plus years in space and what more would you need to take the trip out to Mars? Hey, Dylan. Well, um, first of all, you got to think about your audience here. Uh, I'm in my fifth month in space and I'm three weeks from going home and you're asking me if I want to spend uh, over two years in space. <laughs> <laughs> so at this moment, uh, I'm, uh, I'm pretty focused on uh, being able to uh, wrap up this mission, having done some amazing things uh, and, and get home and see my wife and kids. Um, but but you're right. That is a really, really long time. Um, if could I see myself doing it? I could at some point in my life up to this point, I could absolutely see that happening. If I could contribute to society uh, in a, a very material and a big way, I would happily, happily do that. Um, so it it isn't so much um, do I want to do it today? Uh, you know, I could use a little break uh, when this when this mission is over. Um, but uh, you know, to get to where I am right now, uh, we trained for nine years. That wasn't originally the plan. I was on a different vehicle and originally assigned and then we shifted vehicles. Um, so being gone for two years is a really long time. Um, but when you kind of put it in context of all the other stuff that goes into to accomplishing something like this, yeah, I, I would love it. Um, and I would love to be a part of that. Um, but I think right now what I'm doing here on the space station along with my crew is enabling that to happen. You know, this is where we develop, uh, we develop the technology we need to make it to Mars and back. Long time. Thank you. Uh, hi, Dr. Cassida. Uh, my name is Walker Holmquist. I'm an engineering freshman here at University of Washington and also a cadet at Air Force Detachment 910 or Air Force ROTC Detachment 910. And my question was, uh, how does training differ from living on the International Space Station and flying on the Crew Dragon? And was there any sort of learning curve associated with life in space? Okay, I'm gonna spare you any Navy Force jokes, um, but <laughs> really nice to meet you. And uh, the, the training on the ground is incredible. It is as good as we could possibly do without actually being here. Um, the, the Crew Dragon especially, uh, Nicole and I were, while we were on that launch pad, laying on our backs, we just kept looking at each other saying, is this a sim? It looks and feels exactly like every sim we had done. Um, and that's a testament to the, to the trainers who, who put together the plan, who put together the hardware, who make it all happen and make it feel exactly like the real thing. Um, it's the, it's the case for spacewalking. You know, uh, we went out and, uh, Frank and I did a, a spacewalk and neither one of us had been out the door before. Uh, but we had trained enough on the ground in a pool um, that does certainly have its limitations, but it gets you to a point where you can go out there and get this done. Uh, so it is it is remarkable what what can be done. Um, some of those limitations, though, of course, are um, you know when you're doing it in a pool, you go to pull something really hard. Uh, it's going to take a lot of effort. Um, if I do that here in space, it's really going to start going, and it's probably going to send me off the space station and and my career and probably my life. So. Um, so there are some limitations, but we're, we're aware of these. Um, but you, you really, you know, I hate to say this, but at some level, you, you, can't, you can't really get there uh, mentally until you actually do it. And, and that's the thing that I, I wish I could do. I want to bring everybody up here. I want everyone to experience this. Uh, I want you to get these views and this perspective on life. I think it just, it just solidifies uh, all the priorities you probably already have in mind. That's very interesting. Thank you.
Hi, Dr. Cassida. My name is Jimmy Fowler, and I'm a part of the Husky Flying Club. I know you're a pilot, so you probably think it's pretty cool that we're building the first airplane on campus. Uh, but getting back to the question, uh, as we're getting closer to sending humans to Mars, I'm wondering if we're developing systems to sort of simulate Earth-like conditions on a spacecraft in order to protect the astronauts from the negative effects of extended spaceflight. And if so, uh, are any examples of new technologies like that going to be an Artemis 2 or 3? So awesome question, but first I got to start with the Husky Flying Club. Do you guys fly Huskies? That would be super cool and uh, not ironic at all. I would I would endorse that. Um, no, we don't. What are you guys flying? <laughs> Oh, oh, we are flying. Yeah, we're they're super expensive. I don't fly one either. We're currently building an RV-12. It's a light sport aircraft. It's a light sport aircraft. Yeah, I know it very well. I'm going to live vicariously for, through you, and then I'm going to come get your notes here in a couple of years. Um, in terms of where we're doing our, our terrestrial testing uh, to get good and get ready uh, for a Mars trip and, and in the effect it has on the, the human body, uh, there are certainly uh, studies out there. Uh, you know, they do some bed rest studies. Uh, we do some, some more, I would say less about the physical uh, response, but more the mental response. We, we do some long duration uh, habitat kind of experiments on the ground. Uh, but to tell you where the best analog for long duration space flight is, it's right here on the International Space Station. You know, the International Space Station is a laboratory and we do some really, really cool science. But uh, from my perspective, the number one reason we're here is to get good at long duration space flight. So the systems we're developing here, we're, we're working on and testing right now. And this is kind of funny coming from a test pilot. Our, our test project right now is the toilet that we're going to use on Artemis 2 and Artemis 3. Um, so we need to make sure uh, that these systems are going to work before we send them to deep space. And this is the place to do it because if there's a problem, we can always come back in a hurry. But up here, we can have all kinds of layers of redundancy so that this toilet we're trying and, 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 and working with, you know, literally this week, uh, if there's a problem with that toilet, that's okay. We've got other toilets. We've got a couple others. So that doesn't ruin the mission. Um, you can imagine uh, that being a problem. That's your only toilet. Um, we also uh, develop technologies up here for scrubbing the CO2, the carbon dioxide. Um, so, and we're doing next generation stuff. Again, stuff that's going to be used on the Artemis 2, Artemis 3, and all kinds of space exploration missions. So um, I guess I don't know a lot about the terrestrial testing, but I know a lot about the testing we're actually doing in space, and it's pretty cool to be a part of it. Thank you very much. Hey, Josh, it's Greg again. We have about four minutes and about two more questions, so I'm going to try to get these guys up here real quick, okay? Sounds great. Thank you for the heads up. Hi, Dr. Cassidy. My name is Daniel Weaver. I'm a senior in aeronautics and astronautics here at UW. And my question was, uh, given the ambiguity of up and down in microgravity, is there a way you guys reference directions on the ISS? We do. We've got four forward and aft, zenith and nadir, and port and starboard. Um, I'm doing all those uh, pointing uh, gestures because of, of where I am. The space station is flying in this direction right now, uh, but the space station doesn't fly, right? Uh, so it really doesn't matter what orientation it is, but we typically go this way. So the solar arrays are kind of uh, port and starboard like this, and then we go fore and aft, uh, and that's the direction of travel. Now, when we went out to go do our very first spacewalk, they told us the night before, they said, because of all the radiation we're getting from the sun right now, and the sun isn't really setting all that often for us, we're used to 16 sunrises and sunsets, but the sun, sun sets, the night times were pretty short at that point. They actually had to change the orientation of the, of the uh, space station. So when I opened up the hatch for my very first spacewalk, I looked out and I knew it was coming, but it still didn't look right that the earth was going the wrong direction because the space station was flipped that way. That's pretty cool. I'll pass it on to the next guy. Hi, Dr. Cassida. My name's Harry. I'm also a senior in aeronautics and astronautics here at UW. 
Um, so I was told by a former space shuttle crew member that her experience with underwater welding gave her application an edge during the astronaut selection process because it showed her ability to perform precise tasks while wearing a full body protective suit. Can you think of any other examples of skills which aren't taught in a typical university curriculum that could be beneficial to an astronaut? Uh, sure. Well, first of all, I have no idea uh, what gave me any edge. And because um, when you're in a room full of the most amazing people, you just you realize very quickly uh, that this is just a cool interview process to be a part of. I personally wasn't counting on it. So kudos to her for having such a cool background uh, and, and having something that was so, so applicable. Um, I would say uh, the stuff that isn't taught in a, in a typical kind of STEM uh, syllabus are, are the things that that make you uncomfortable. Um, the things that are just uh, not things you're used to. Um, so whether that's flying an airplane, which was in my case, or uh, or academically doing something uh, different, but uh, you know, a lot of people are into camping and and outdoors. Uh, I'm in the military, so I've gotten a lot of that organically, and I we don't tend to do that on our own. But I love it just just fine when it's uh, part of my part of my job and when I'm working with my crew. Um, so I think that kind of stuff, the stuff that isn't uh, isn't your comfort zone, even physically. I think that stuff is probably really applicable because uh, it's not real, real comfortable all the time up here. Uh, I'm a guy who's uh, been up here for uh, going on five months and I haven't showered, right? So you have to get used to uh, kind of being able to deal with a, a situation that you wouldn't ordinarily choose. And Thank I you. realize we are probably seconds away from losing this satellite. So I just want to, before we get cut off, and if we do get cut off, I'm not hanging up in anger. Uh, it's not my fault. Uh, but I just want to say to White Bear Lake, to Albion, to University of Washington, holy cow, this is so cool. Thank you so much for uh, for inviting me to be a part of this. Josh, it was awesome to see you. Thank you for doing this. Get home safely. Can't wait to give you a hug uh, on land here. That sounds great. Everybody have a great weekend. And uh, I guess it's lunchtime uh, on the West Coast. Take care.